Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is Daniel Umstead, host of the RNG Radio Show. I got another international uh, guest on the RNG Radio Show. Let me run through his bio real quick. Uh, so my guest is managing partner at Invest Asian and uh, used to be a co-star alongside Jim Carrey's 2001 hit, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. For over a decade, um, my guest has searched Asia for some of the world's top performing investments. Uh, he directs Invest Asian's global research and day-to-day -day operations, focusing on uncorrelated assets that will grow and preserve client wealth. Uh, he moved to Asia the week after he turned 18 and soon thereafter graduated with a finance degree from Chulo Longhorn University, uh, which is based out in Thailand. He then started the world's first uh, frontier market property fund in Cambodia. And from buying property in Thailand to trading stocks in Singapore, he has had the answers to your questions about investing all across Asia. Uh, he's been investing in real estate, private equity in Asia for more than a decade. So to say that he knows this stuff is clearly an understatement. Um, as mentioned before, um, he was a child actor um, in the Jim Carrey movie, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. In addition, around a dozen nationally aired TV commercials for Captain Crunch cereal while growing up in uh, LA. So you're probably wondering like, you know, where the ship came in. Well, the government uh, has put in his body. The government actually keeps your money until you're an adult. So unless you invest in it. And this has led to his career, strangely enough, um, where most of his time was spent reading books. So ladies and gentlemen, if you know me and I'm gonna be asking our guest on the show, what are some books to uh, dive into right now? but doing research online and trading international stocks, which has led to my guest, Mr. Reed Kirkenbauer from uh, investasian.com. Reed, how are you doing today, man? Oh, I'm great, Daniel. Thanks for having me on here. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I usually confirm this uh, before we even get started with the show that I say your last name correctly. Yes, yes, you got okay. it. Uh, I'd say like nine out of 10 people get it wrong, but uh, you were the one this week who got it correctly. <laughs> Now that's how you start a Monday, ladies and gentlemen. If you listen to this right now, probably on a Wednesday, like, wait, what day is it? So uh, we already got a 12-hour difference. So I'm up here, uh, just finished my first cup of coffee. Uh, and Reed is uh, pretty much his starting his evening tea, uh, perhaps, probably. Pretty so um, <laughs> and Tea right here, actually. Bam, there it is. There it is. So we're just going to hop right into the questions here. So my big thing, um, how did you go? From a child actor in Los Angeles, because most child actors, you know, they got this pathway of, you know, growing up and then they're on this show or they get selected for this movie. But no, you went from a child actor in Los Angeles, Los Angeles, mind you, if folks are looking at a man, all the way out in Asia. And it's not that you went to Asia and you started something, uh, you know, typically of the norm, you know, give it to the lifestyle. No, you said, I'm gonna do real estate investing. So please uh, break down your story, Reed. Uh, I know folks wanna hear this. Yes, and as you said, uh, child actors either go away or uh, keep going on. I went away, but I went on to do something else. Uh, so when I was very young, six, seven, eight years old, I did uh, mostly television work, uh, national TV commercials in the U.S. I uh, did Captain Crunch, a Sears commercial, Toys R Us, things like that. Uh, I was also on The Grinch Who Stole Christmas uh, 2000 with Jim Carrey, Ron Howard. Um, so uh, after about, I turned uh, nine, ten years old, my parents moved to Texas. And it's kind of hard to land an acting gig in Austin, Texas. So uh, that kind of uh, put an end to my short acting career. And what I did, uh, what did happen was I became very interested in the stock market. So I was 12, 13 years old by this time we were living in Texas. And usually, as, as you said also before, uh, the government keeps your money if you're in the situation where you're a child and you're making some amount of income. The government usually keeps that in a trust fund or they let your parents hold on to it if it's a smaller amount. And here I was, I was 13 years old. I was thinking, well, I can buy even more video games and toys or whatever I was interested in at the time uh, if I learn how to invest this money. And that led me to be very interested in the stock market and um, just investment in general. So I took some of that money. Uh, I was buying stocks in Asia. Uh, I took, uh, I didn't get rich off of it, but I made, you know, low six figure hundred thousand dollars or so off of the television work i did oh, so i wasn't rolling in good. cash 
<laughs> yeah, I was doing well for a, you know, for a prepubescent kid. Uh, <laughs> it was enough to uh, put a down payment on a duplex in Austin, uh, which we sold a few years later, uh, myself and uh, some a friend of mine who uh, we, we kind of split uh, the payment on this duplex. So we did that in Austin, and I was very interested in stocks mostly is what I was doing. So fast okay. forward several years later, I was graduating high school about this time, and I was uh, traveling a bit. And one place I ended up was Thailand. And I thought, well, this is a place I could, you know, spend four years. You know, food is great. People are friendly, very international city, lots of things to do. 15 million people. You have beaches that look like Hawaii, a few hours drive from the city. So I thought, you know, this is where I can spend four years. And nobody else was, uh, you know, in my graduating class, pretty much everyone else was going to UT, University of Texas. So I thought, you know, it's a way to distinguish myself and kind of see how, uh, how business works in an emerging part of the world, maybe make some connections. So practically the day after I turned 18, it wasn't the day after, but it was, you know, give or take a, a week or two, uh, flew out to Thailand. And uh, I've pretty much been out here since. Uh, I mostly wow. do business in Cambodia, Vietnam nowadays, simply because their economies are growing faster than Thailand's. Um, but that's a kind of an abbreviated version of my life story. Wow. Wow. I, I mean, it's just the, you know, the jump. And I guess uh, it should be more clear, you know, you going from L.A. to Austin, Texas, and then out to Asia. Um, you know, uh, uh, the next question is, you know, why Asia? You know, there's uh, plenty of growth, you know, in the real estate market, you know, despite current rates and everything like that um, going on right now. But, you know, with the real estate markets in Cambodia and the Philippines, what is the benefit over there compared to the U.S.? Well, the way the way I see it is that you have in Cambodia, for example, the average age is 25 years old. There's a lot of urbanization, people moving from rural areas into the city. Phnom Penh, which is Cambodia's capital, has a population of 3 million right now. It's expected to be 5 million by the end of the decade. So what I see is a real estate market, real estate, several of them, I should say. It's not just Cambodia. It's Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia. All of them kind of have these trends of demographic, demographics, population growth, people moving into the city, which naturally boosts real estate demand. So I see these yeah. markets as reliant more so on internal factors than uh, the whims of the market, so to speak. And that's why I'm out here in Asia, uh, mostly. Okay. All right, cool. And then um, as far as, uh, you know, over here in the U.S., and I'm pretty sure, of course, you know as well, um, with commercial and residential, residential, you know, it's got to go through a hundred items, you know, checklists, even just to buy a house commercial definitely is more on the private side. Are you seeing that same thing over there in Asia or is the difference uh, with the difference between commercial and residential? Commercial, as is, I think the mo is it's the case most cities in the world, most countries. But commercial real estate definitely yields higher than residential. If you are uh, able to get the correct property, uh, there's some sectors right now, such as office, for example, which are uh, seeing some tougher times just because of work from home. But in Asia, um, it's a uh, the process of buying property is very different than what you would find in the West. Uh, of course, in the U.S., the very first thing you would do is uh, go find a real estate agent if you're looking to buy property in the U.S. or most developed Western markets. Uh, here in a lot of developing countries, um, a lot of, well, there isn't an MLS system uh, for, for starters. So you can't really go to a single portal and get an overall view of the entire market, which makes things difficult. Um what a lot of people will do is they'll just hang a sign outside their window that says for sale in Cambodian or Thai, whatever the local language is. And uh, the way to find these properties and find good deals is what I did, what I will, I used to do it. Now I have people who help me do, uh, help me do that for me. But uh, you just ride a motorcycle down the street, take down phone numbers of people who hang the for sale signs out their window, call them. Maybe it leads to something, maybe it doesn't. But the process for buying real estate, whether commercial or residential, is very different. 
Wow. I mean, I look at it that as, you know, opportunity, because uh, as you know, in the States, it's driving for dollars, you know, and some folks still, you know, see that as a benefit. But now, um, you know, with driving for dollars, it's like now you could just take a picture and uh, you get a postcard that could be sent immediately out, depending upon the app that you're using. But over there, you know, although it seems like, quote unquote, behind the times, you're actually ahead of the times because you're pretty much either taking practices that are, you know, already done in the States over there, you know, and just making it better. Um, Reed, before we continue on, where can, uh, can you give us the website uh, again, as far as um, where folks can find more information? Yes, investasian.com is probably the best place to uh, read up and uh, contact me, look at, uh, find out what services we offer. I mostly do consulting services, but investasian.com, there's over 200 articles about everything from foreign real estate, uh, international stocks, expat guides, um, all sorts of content uh, and we're updating things by the week uh, but yes that's the main place to go is the website awesome 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 and then um in the past year because you know with uh and more specifically you know with the uh, covid um happening over there because and i had some friends especially when i was working uh not my current employer or even most recent employer but prior to that uh, we were doing, you know, third party outsourcing and work with those individuals in the Philippines. And then, you know, for COVID, they they were locked down, locked down. You know, it wasn't as much freedom as it was over the States. How has the real estate market, you know, performed over there, you know, post COVID now? We're starting to see some change over here, but what are you looking at over there? Yes, in the past few years, things have been mostly flat as opposed to a lot of especially coastal cities, tech hubs in the U.S. and around the world in general. Prices uh, from 2020 until, I suppose, last year have just uh, skyrocketed in L.A., Austin, London, most uh, major Western cities. In Asia, though, travel restrictions have kept things subdued, for better or worse. Um, so there have been substantial travel restrictions in the past few years. I'm able to come and go for the most part simply because I have a long-term visa. But up until very recently, if you wanted to visit most play, most countries in Asia as a tourist, you just weren't able to. They didn't give you the, uh, the visa stamp on arrival. You had to have a reason or go through some long period of quarantine in practically every country in the region from Thailand to Japan. And as of the middle to late last year, depending on the country, things have started to open up. And become much easier. Um, and because of that, foreign demand has been very high over the past several months. So to answer your question, things have been very flat in a lot of Asian markets over the past few years. But the bright side of that is uh, there's still a lot of opportunity left. There isn't uh, as much talk of a bubble in, as there is in some markets uh, in the Western world. So uh, Things over the past few years have been tough just because of travel restrictions. I think uh, we're about to see some similar price gains to what uh, a lot of markets saw recently. Okay, awesome, awesome. And then um, the other question I wanted to know, because um, uh, of course everybody's paying attention to the news. You know, uh, Fed keeps saying like, "Hey, we just moved up twenty-five basis points." Hey, we just moved up twenty-five basis points. Hey. Guess what we just did? Move up 25 yep. basis points. And we're starting to see probably another increase definitely before the end of the year. With the basis points, you know, going over here, seeing that increase and not really flatlining anytime soon. It, how has that affected? I mean, I know you had mentioned things are flat right now, but is it showing like to be a benefit or pretty much being a consequence with that happening over in the States? Interest rates have for the most part, gone up in Asia, along with uh, those in the U.S. And just interest rates do vary depending on the country. There isn't, uh, I suppose, such thing as a global interest rate. It depends on what currency you're looking at, which country. And uh, Japan, for example, uh, which has uh, famously had issues with deflation over the past few decades, their uh, interest rates right now are about 3% or so, so quite a bit lower than those in the U.S. right now. Um, similar story in several countries in Asia. But yes, borrowing costs are just getting more expensive. Um, and that's um, if, it, if the 
rate hikes continue, I suppose, will be a problem. They'll, they say, say they're only doing one more in the U.S. So I guess there's hope for real estate investments. Yes, fingers crossed, <laughs> real estate investors in general that uh, later this year will start seeing some rate decreases. And uh, those would, uh, of course, uh, those decreases would follow in Asia, Europe, the rest of the world. Okay. All right. Awesome. Awesome. And I got a few more questions uh, for you before we wrap up here. Um, so U.S. individuals, or I should say those folks in the States and, you know, pretty much, I guess, uh, around the world, how can individuals invest in property, you know, without spending millions of dollars or even taking out a large mortgage? Because, you know, I, other folks are seeing, uh, even myself recently, uh, me and my business partner, uh, we pretty much pulled out of the stock market you know, and now we're looking at different ways to invest. But of course, we don't have millions of dollars just sitting around to do so. It's pretty much in the thousands. Somebody like myself, or maybe even somebody in the hundreds per se, um, how could they pretty much get a part or some of this action out in the Asian market? What could they be doing? I think a good way to invest, especially internationally, um, is through real estate investment trusts, REITs. And these are, um, there's REITs all around the world. There's uh, many in the US. Uh, if you want to invest in a REIT in Asia, you would likely have to have a brokerage account with access to Asian markets. So this could be Interactive Brokers, which has access to some of the main ones, Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, but doesn't give extensive regional coverage across Asia. Um, for that, you would probably need to open a brokerage account directly in Singapore and trade with uh, in some of these REITs property funds. Um, so yes, I, th I think REITs are, are a good way to um, able to take take advantage of the economies of scale and achieve higher yields, deal with them. Um, uh, of course, if you're investing in a fund, somebody else is able to handle the management. And all of that is uh, usually easy enough if you're buying property in the U.S., but when you're starting to diversify internationally and uh, expand your holdings into uh, different currencies, different financial systems, things can get difficult, especially with property, because um, as is with the case anywhere, you have tenants to manage. And what if a property, uh, you know, what if the pipe busts and it's a 12 hour time difference away? So I think that uh, that funds re and REITs can be a good way to uh, make the investment more passive when you're entering a kind of more uncertain in a more uncertain market. Okay. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Appreciate that, man. Now, um, the uh, other question um uh, wanted to know now outside of folks just googling how to open a brokerage account in Singapore uh can you pretty much give like a quick run through as far as you know what are some of like the basic requirements you know outside of of course being over 18 in order to do so for the most part well anyone with about i would say $10,000 or so can open an, a brokerage account in Singapore um the vast majority of brokers uh, will you'll have to make a trip and fly to Singapore in order to open an account with them. There are a few where things are easier and it can be done by mail. Things are um, on a case by case basis, though. Um, U.S. clients in particular, it can be difficult to open accounts with as um, there are exceptions. There are banks who are willing to work with U.S. clients brokerages, too. But um it's a, I would say, very much on a case by case basis. Although generally speaking, um, it can be done with, I would say, ten, twenty thousand dollar minimum. Okay, no, that's great, great information. Appreciate that. And then um, we talked about your bio. You spent time reading books. Can you give me, and uh, you know, just to uh, save time here, can you give me uh, two top books that uh, you pretty much hold dear to, or even? offered even as an advice um, for those either, you know, getting invested um, into real estate, into the Asian market, or in just in general, uh, just doing our world real estate investing? Yes, I, I have two. Um, well, the first one would be Nomad Capitalist by Andrew Henderson, um, who's a business partner, a colleague of mine. And that um, is a book that will show you really the benefits of diversifying not only your investments, but your lifestyle internationally, living in different countries, getting different residencies and passports. I think that's very useful for anyone living in international lifestyle. The second is 
I don't remember the author's name. I can look it up. The name of the book is Next Hundred Years. Um, okay. And that gives you a um, uh, an overview of geopolitical based analysis of what uh, the next hundred years will look like, what uh, will be some of the rising countries that will play a greater role in the world, what some of the major uh, issues, dilemmas, wars even uh, will be this century. And I think uh, geopolitics plays a very good, uh, found. it has a very good foundation for investing over the long term. Um, for example, you can see uh, real estate prices in cities like Istanbul, Turkey, Dubai that have just skyrocketed uh, yeah. the past year because of uh, wealthy Russians and Ukrainians escaping the war. And that's something that, uh, you know, a lot of money to be made from something geopolitically based. Uh, so uh, I think that's very uh, important analysis to uh, be done. And the, the, the author's name is George Friedman, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And to add on, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the book was uh, published back in 2009. So just grabbing the book alone and just seeing, you know, with the prediction by George Friedman, you know, even in the next 10 years, because, or uh, I'm sorry, we're in 2023, the next 14 years, you know, to see what already George pretty much laid out for you, um, you know, and if he's right about that, you know, you should be able to see further on. So, Man, uh, Reed, thank you so much, you know, for everything, for the books, you know, the breakdown. Um, the last question I wanted to ask you um, is in regards to motivation. So I asked my guests, you know, to pretty much uh, tell me, you know, what keeps me motivated? Because we have our great days where we're like, yo, I'm pumped. I'm excited. I'm eating the frog today with some uh, mashed potatoes and some green beans and biscuits. So I'm ready to get this day started. And then we have those days where it's just like, you know what? As long as this day gets me to 5 p.m., I'm going to be good to go. The days were, you know, it, it's not so great. It, it's ugly. You know, appointments are being canceled. You know, deals may be lost on the table. How does one stay motivated? How do you even stay motivated, you know, when it comes to those uh, dark days sometimes? I think it's important to have something to look forward to in the future, uh, whether it be, you know, it, it can be a vacation. It could be something smaller, like a nice dinner for yourself you plan uh on the weekend and i think having that you know either a small or perhaps not so small thing to look forward to and say oh this weekend i'm going to uh you know be eating steak or you know having lots of fun doing what i want i think having that uh is is very important in life awesome awesome i love that man ladies and gentlemen read Kirkenbauer of investasian.com. Reed, thank you again so much for being on the show, man. Definitely looking forward to having you come back. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for tuning in to the RNG Radio Show. Be sure to like and subscribe for more episodes and future content. If you'd like to learn more, visit us at danielumstead.com. Stay blessed, my fellow millionaires.